How are you doing, Ismail? Uh, fine, thank you. And yourself? I'm good. We're here in Oslo, and you're calling us from where exactly? Paris. From Paris. From Paris, yeah. Great. I hope it's uh, somewhat uh, milder than it is here, but here it's also pretty mild, but it's been a mm -hmm. very cold winter so far. Uh, thanks again for the film. Um, I think this was a very... Uh, hmm? Yeah, of course. Um, I think uh, this was a very... Um, extreme experience so, so far in terms of like the programming otherwise that uh, Mira and Cecilia have been doing. Um, so thank you for sh uh, showing this. Um, there are many things to kind of delve into and Mira had uh, this wonderful introduction as well, uh, detailing some of the political context for the film being made as well. Um, I was thinking of uh, touching into some formal aspects as well as the methodology of both this, but also how uh, you're working, uh, been working the past decade as well in different types of collect collective units with filmmaking. But to start off, uh, what I was reading was uh, because, I mean, this film is obviously very much influenced by uh, the f film noir mo movement of like the 40s and 50s in the United States and in, in Germany and France, um, which seems very deliberate politically. Um, in terms of the jadedness and cynicism that's kind of involved in both that period, but also, I assume, in the Tunisian context, and especially with such explicit content. But I also read that uh, with your co-director, Yusuf Shebi, that uh, he actually uh, approached you with this prospect of uh, remaking Miss 45 by Abel uh, Ferrara. Is this true? Yeah. Yeah, it is exactly true. It's, uh, it's what started the whole thing, actually. Uh, well, it started in 2011 with Yusuf because we already did a documentary together uh, in 2012. And we were actually at that point three directors. We did a documentary called Babylon. And uh, we became friends uh, doing this uh, documentary. And we, uh, and we like, we continued uh, following each other's careers and lives and whatever for four years and years and uh, at some point in 2014 or 15 uh, Yusuf told me that he had this idea that he wanted to do a remake of, uh, of an American film directed by Abel Ferrara who was released actually the day of my, uh, the, uh, the year of my birth in 81 and uh, and he wanted to do this uh, this remake of Mrs. 45. Uh, however, I wasn't like personally uh, very involved or interested because Abel Ferrara is not a director that I like very much. I have a lot of issues with his cinema. Um, and also because I, at this point, I didn't see Mrs. 45, actually. So Yusuf was like very um, ambitious about it and he was talking about it a lot. And I was totally not engaged with, the, with this project, you know. And it um, and it went like that for like four or five years. And at some point, uh, we met again with Yusuf in Tunis. He was actually at that uh, time living in Paris, and I was in Lebanon at that time. It was in 2019. Uh, we met during the um, summer holiday vacations in Tunis, our hometown. And he again, Yusuf again, started to talk to me about this idea to do a remake of Mrs. 45. And I was like, like, like the whole years before that, I was like not very interested in, in like doing the film with him. Uh, but what happened is that uh, at this very moment, one day I had an image, uh, an image pop up in my head. And it was um, an image that we see in the beginning of the movie is, uh, is the image of a young woman uh, penetrating uh, the body of an, a man with, uh, with a stick. So I, it was during the night, I woke up the uh, day after and start, started writing uh, a script. I wrote like 30 or 15 pages uh, in a couple of days and I used to read them. And he was totally enthusiastic about uh, about what he uh, read. So we worked a little bit together on the script, and we decided to do it like right away, uh, without waiting for financing or without doing workshops or whatever. 
So uh, we collected a little bit of money and equipment and we did it uh, a couple of months afterwards. Yeah, because yeah. you shot it in uh, just about like, I think under two weeks, I think. Yeah, it was precisely 12 days. We shot it in 12 days, uh, which is kind of two weeks of work because in Tunisia, like when we say a week um, during the shooting, it means like six days of work and one day of, uh, of free. It's free day. So it was a uh, two weeks, but precisely 12 days of work, of shooting work, actually, on the set with the uh, crew and, uh, and actors. Yeah. Did you eventually uh, see Miss 45, by the way, like before you actually made the film? Exactly. Well, uh, when, there some when key we differences? started like, developing, developing the script and prepping the shooting, etc. At some point, it was like a couple of weeks before we started shooting. I, uh, I saw actually the film, which I liked, by the way. Um, and uh, it was uh, really weird because uh, I was obviously when I wrote the first draft of the of Black Medusa, I was influenced by not by Mrs. Forty Five itself, but what Yusuf was telling me about Mrs. Forty Five during those five years, you know. So it was weird when I saw the film, but I found out that there's a lot of similarities, uh, a lot of scenes that are like kind of the same in a way, but also, uh, which is important, is that as, as someone who wrote uh, the first draft of the script of Black Medusa and I didn't see Mrs. 45, it was kind of, I think the two films are kind of different, uh, the one, one from the other. And I believe Black Medusa, it's kind of like the opposite in a way of Mrs. 45. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and just for those who haven't seen uh, Miss 45, it's this 80s film by Abel Ferrara that, uh, which I think like exactly is different in this aspect that uh, it starts out, I suppose, with uh, the protagonist being uh, raped twice a day uh, in the same day. And continuing on from that, uh, she gets this uh, uh, impulse of having this 45 gun, this Colt 45 and then increasingly starting to sh uh, shoot guys seemingly uh, at random intervals. But that is much more like a character journey that's happening gradually. Well, it's in Black Medusa, I find that uh, she's already kind of fully formed here in the beginning. Exactly. She is fully formed and she has this really ritualized life. She's very in control of uh, herself, of her relationships, of... Uh, of the city even uh, in which she evolves and also uh, which is kind of uh, the, the, uh, like the uh, obvious uh, different points between the two films is that in Black Medusa we we don't like we feel she's like she's in a revenge style of uh, living but we don't really understand as viewers what uh, what she's um, um, uh, what what the trauma is, what the trauma of the character is, you know. There's this um, dreamy like scene at the beginning of the film with this guy in, in black who follows her and who kind of put her uh, put his arms onto her uh, throat. However, it's uh, like all dreams it can be uh, interpreted in different ways. And uh, our character is Nada. In the film, she's never uh, raped or sexually harassed or whatever. So uh, it's the it's I think the first like and biggest difference between the two films. Also, uh, character wise, Nada is strong at the beginning of the film, and she became more and she become more and more uh, sensitive and more and more uh, in touch with the reality that. Uh, um that she's in and she has this kind of uh, friendly and loving relationship with this other uh, female character uh nura etc while the character in mrs 45 she's uh, sensitive at the beginning and she became a killer at the end of the film like uh, afterwards you know so it's kind of um the opposite trajectory of the character, you know, between the two the two films. Mm. Uh, and she it does in terms of like film noir inhabit is very clear role as well as like the femme fatale, the dangerous woman. And whilst watching the movie, I was kind of of two minds in terms of that. In one way, it's kind of 
in a Tunisian context, it's a very like straightforward thing. It is really like taking the patriarchal structures by the jugular, and which is uh, I've uh, also f I found interesting, like comparing to you know my experience with Pakistan, which is kind of surprisingly in some areas it's not as what would you say uh, religiously theocratic as one would assume. Like you can't you can't actually walk around with uh, like uh, being. Uh, uh, having your hair covered as a woman although there is the prospect of like you shouldn't really dare to do that it will bring consequences and Tuni uh, tunisia has, has this very i mean legislatively it has this context of like uh, different types of uh, laws that can kind of try to constitute some sort of equality between men and women but it's still a very patriarchal culture and so uh, i assume that and, and this movie then really becomes provocative in that sense but I'm also thinking of uh, the film in terms of this thing that's, well, both you and Yusuf uh, are men making this and kind of the ethical landscapes of, uh, you know, this trauma thing and this thing of sexual violence, whilst it isn't like pronounced as she has gone through sexual violence before uh, the story commences, it definitely kind of goes through the trajectory of this kind of thorny landscape. So I'm uh, wondering what you and uh, Yusuf were thinking about this kind of ethical um, aspect. Yeah, well, uh, it's uh, for us. It was, it was kind of uh, obvious and weird in the same way to uh, to be two uh, two men doing a film about uh, this woman and her relationship with another woman and the trauma of being a woman and how is it possible to be a woman in nowadays Tunisia, post-revolutionary Tunisia? You know, so we were asking ourselves a lot of questions around around those topics and uh, issues when we were like writing and prepping and even even afterwards you know even in post we were like uh, still asking ourselves those questions and um, well the first the first thing that we tried to do to uh, um, to be self-critical about ourselves as men is not to judge this this character you know um we we wanted her to be uh, as free as possible uh free uh, socially politically uh, humanly and also kind of free from our uh, male gaze you know and our point of view as male director doing doing a film about uh, the strong female character you know so we try to avoid any uh, moral uh, point of view on what she's doing, on her trajectory, on her life, on her actions. Uh, and we also, uh, which has come from that, we, we try to avoid any psychologization, if I may say. Uh, there is no psychology in the film. We, we, we don't try to understand her actions. We only try to observe her and try to be as faithful as we can be as male directors doing a film on a, on a woman um, character, you know. I don't know if we succeeded in that, but actually we, we, uh, we tried our best. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, and it, it was just one thing very specifically that I also wanted to touch down with the film, the specific scene with the cab driver as well. Which, if I'm not mistaken, is actually a very direct reference to the uh, Me Too movement that uh, was sparked in uh, Tunisia as well. If you can uh, elaborate on that well, one. <laughs> actually, it's not a direct reference. It's, it's just something that it's in the air with uh, young women uh, sometimes having some sort of sexual harassment from cab drivers uh, at late late at night when there's no one in the streets, etc. It's something that it's not a social thing, you know, it doesn't happen every night in every corner of the city. However, there's some stories about some some um, harassment stuff uh, happening for young ladies uh, when they are uh, alone in the streets at night, you know. I was uh, thinking of uh, like uh, there was an incident with uh, one of the parliamentary members, Zuhair Maklouf. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, a different kind, a different kind of, uh, a different kind of incident because right. he was like deputy member and it was on broad daylight and he was in his car, and he was like uh, stalking on uh, young women 
in front of a high school. So uh, it kind of different, and it, it happened actually. I believe it happened after we after we shot uh, we shot uh, we shot the film. Um, yeah, it was it was well. The first things first. The uh, the cab driver is uh, he's actually also a filmmaker director. His name is Ali Din Slim, and he was the third one filmmaker uh, with Yusuf and myself who did uh, this. Uh, first documentary uh, I talked to you about at the beginning of uh, our Q&A Babylon? at Babylon. Exactly. So he was he was the third uh, filmmaker and uh, and we were looking for for um, for uh, an actor who, for the scene and and it was totally random. We met him on the streets and we started talking and we, uh, and we asked him to do it and, and he actually d- uh, did it. However, the, the, the interesting, I think, um, aspect uh, you know, with this scene is that at, um, it starts with the, it starts like uh, the character is in danger, you know, she's kind of uh, afraid of the situation and she takes hold of, of the knife. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the guy doesn't like, doesn't touch her or try anything directly with her. He's just like uh, putting himself in the situation of being observed, you know, of being seen, uh, masturbating, and um, and we and at the end of the scene we see that Nadez, after being frightened by him, she's kind of like looking at him with with more uh, more tranquil eyes and more like she's more. Um, She's more cool with it, if, if I may say. So it's also uh, a way for us to uh, to to point out um, the kind of uh, sexual perversions also that she's that Nada is in, you know. Because ultimately, I think she's she's looking for for yes, yeah, sexual uh, fulfillment. Uh, she has a weird way to do it. Obviously, uh, uh, however, I think she's she's it's the way she does it. It's her way to to yeah to be to feel the uh, to feel the sexual um, sexual yeah feeling. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I was thinking if uh, there's any questions uh, from the room, then I don't know if we have a microphone to pass around or how it is. Anyone? Hand raise. Yeah. Hello. I, I had a sort of a two part question. Um, the first part is uh, do you identify the film with any sort of uh, tradition of cinema of transgression uh, in this sort of historical way? And the second part is. Um, in this sort of transgressive kind of element, do you think if you had gotten financing outside of yourself, what parts of the film do you think would not be possible? Does that make so sense? I didn't, I didn't hear very much the question. Can you summarize them very quickly? Uh, yeah, I was just interested in this sort of transgressive uh, element of the film, sort of if this was done sort of consciously. Or and if this was done consciously, is this would have been possible to do with with uh, financing? Was there sort of a a way around the problem by not getting financing? If that makes sense. Do you hear that now? Yeah. Well, actually, um, about the financing, uh, the way we did it is uh, that we uh, we financed the. Uh, actually, I have a production company. I'm producer also, uh, besides being director. So it was totally self-financed by my production company and uh, and other like private investments, direct investments from friends actually. Um, so w- the idea with Yusuf was uh, to uh, to do like kind of uh, kind of. Um, how to say it, like uh, a free way of doing the film, you know? And the first thing when you talk about freedom in, mo- in the movie industry is is to solve the money issue, you know? Because doing a film is also expensive. 
uh, um, and uh, it's the main uh, issue that you deal with, like between the day you finish the script writing and the day you finish the film. Like it's the big question is the financing question. However, uh, we didn't want to go through the uh, normal way of financing films, which is like uh, write a script and then apply to so to grants and foundings, etc. Because it takes time, and also because uh, it wasn't the kind of like uh, road that you wanted to to do with the film. We wanted to to uh, prep it and shoot it and finish it as as uh, quickly as we uh, wrote it, which we did. And it was only possible if we uh, did it by ourselves, you know, totally independently from any, um, any financing uh, partners. So it, it wasn't easy, but uh, we managed to do it. And um, with a lot of like, uh, help from friends and relatives and family etc um, i guess we did it was our first debut film and i i guess we did like with other uh, movie directors that started this way you know from stanley kubrick to david lynch to whatever uh, a lot of movie directors started doing their first film by their own means and i think in a way it's um, it's uh, it grants you more freedom because you're uh, you're kind of alone doing it. You know, uh, you don't have like a lot of people involved financially, so uh, you're kind of free. But it wasn't um, it wasn't desire motivated by the subject of the of the film or the topic of the film. You know, it was only our desire at that point in our lives to do something. Uh, in a punk style uh, way, you know. I'm I'm also thinking about this thing of financing, which is really the big word with filmmaking. I think just on the production side, in any context, uh, also in particular to how y uh, you're working in these collectives, like um, especially with Attack, uh, before and after uh, the revolution. Uh, I read an interview uh, that you and, and done. Uh, that was uh, quite interesting about like kind of what differed in, in pre and post revolution in that sense about how to kind of organize in this way. So I don't know if you have any uh, thoughts about how th that's kind of been changing uh, both in, uh, in the making of this film, but also like before the revolution and the way uh, things are organized. Well, uh, um, for cinema wise, uh, the, uh, if I put it this way, the uh, revolution of Tunisian cinema preceded and came before the political and social revolution, because the um, since uh, since the beginning of the uh, of the century uh, or the millennia, um, th th there wasn't Tunisia. There was um, two things that happened uh, at that time. Uh, the global thing. It's obviously uh, the. Uh, Digital uh, happened, you know, digital camera and digital softwares to edit your movie, etc. So it became easier and cheapest to do uh, to do your own your own uh, movies. And the other thing is that at that time there was the first uh, universities, cinema universities in the country, you know, public ones, not private ones. So uh, everybody could. Uh, at the, after high school, could so choose to do uh, cinema. Uh, studies and became and become a director so those two aspects the digital uh, and the uh, cinema schools in tunisia um, made like facilitated an the emergence of a new of a new generation of filmmakers that are not um, how to say it that are not from the bourgeoisie because before that historically the Tunisian cinema was made mainly by the the upper class of society you know and from the biggest cities of the country so uh, since 20 years now the social aspect of the uh, directors and producers and actors and writers etc 
uh, has totally changed in Tunisia. There is more uh, diversity of uh, social diversity um, and, and like crews, film crews and uh, producers and directors, etc. So this is the first the first aspect of it. And obviously, after the re revolution, it became more and more important because uh, there is a curiosity from the outside, you know, uh, from the from the world, uh, seeing the revolution happening and what artists and filmmakers had to say or show about uh, about those um, big changes in the, uh, in the Arab uh, in the Arab world. So it was kind of um, like this new generation of Tunisian filmmakers working nowadays are kind of yeah are were born in the in the right uh, in the right time I think they were born like 20 years before the digital and before the public cinema schools and 30 years before the revolution so all those aspects um, all those aspects like made the Tunisian cinema more more diverse I think nowadays than was 20 or 30 years ago and i'll just uh, ask again if there's any other questions mira had one is it working yes hi ismail um, hi. <laughs> um so i wanted i'm just uh I want, i'm curious to hear um about the formal choice of making a film noir in present day Tunisia or in post war uh, post that war post revolution Tunisia what uh, what does why was this choice motivated uh, to go back into this you know older genre uh, and how what does it say about this youth uh, that you know were on the street that made this revolution what does it tell about that uh, youth uh, now the, you know this choice that you that you guys uh, took well, <laughs> um, actually, the, the easiest way to answer uh, to answer this question is to say that uh, the film noir is one of my favorite genres. I I like watching those old American movies in black and white uh, uh, films. Um, uh, even nowadays, you know, it's uh, it's a genre I like that I appreciate a lot for his like uh, visual uh, aspects but also for his social aspects because it's uh, it's a genre that it's um, very interesting because it shows us uh, a lot of like the common american uh, guy or girl uh, of the 30s and 40s uh, like waitresses and uh, private detectives and uh, cab drivers and like the small folks you know and through through uh, form and a cinematic language that is for me uh, phenomenal. Uh, so th that's the easy uh, the easy answer to the question. The more complicated one is that um, it's related to the uh, to uh, to the story and also related to actually uh, to um, to w what I think. Is uh, is common between uh, between this uh, geographical area, which is the United States of the, of the 30s and 40s, and Tunisia nowadays. Um, as I said, Yusuf was more interested in the uh, New York of the 70s, and I guess I wasn't, I didn't totally agree with that. I thought that um, the uh, 30s and 40s were uh, a lot more. Uh, uh, how to say um, a lot more um, th there's a lot of th there's a lot more bridges that we can build between the 30s and the 40s than the uh, 70s because it's it's kind of a period in between two big uh, great wars the first one and the second one so it's kind of in between world um, and which is also very uh, very like that speak to me a lot that uh, the film noir is actually himself 
very influenced by the uh, German expressionism and the uh, French uh, realism magic, uh, magical realism, you know, which are oldest uh, film genre. But the common point between the, the whole, uh, those three, uh, the very different uh, genre and from different countries and different um, uh, years is that they're very, very interested in the small folk and the margin people and mental illnesses and, and like very actual uh, topics and issues that were still like uh, that are still very important, and I think they are uh, kind of um, important in today's uh, Tunisian uh, society. You know, uh, for example, the mental illness thing. You know, it's it's a big deal in Tunisia. There's studies that say that uh, like 60% of Tunisian people are depressed. You know, and uh, they are anxious and. Uh, so, which is kind of, kind of natural because we, uh, we like ten days, uh, ten years ago, we, we experienced something that we uh, couldn't imagine, which is like a revolution. You know, uh, not a total and complete change of the political and social system, but a change, uh, even if it's a small one, but it's an important change in, uh, in the political and. Uh, and uh, social uh, Tunisia, you know, and uh, with change, there's al there's always, I think, the uh, the anxiety of the unknown, you know, because when you change your reality, you don't really know what's going to to happen to you and to your family and to your uh, to your neighbors, etc. Because you're kind of facing the unknown, and that's I think what. Uh, what interests me in those kind of films because they um, they were made after uh, a radical change, which is a great work, and and they are and they were in kind of uh, yeah looking and searching and trying to find out what will come next, you know. So yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great point and, and great to tie that also into this thing of uh, the uh, use of like light and darkness of expressionism and uh, the nighttime. I know at least uh, with Amita's practice as well, that uh, this is an interest of like the subconscious and how in these types of films and the motif of the nighttime where desires really come forth that are otherwise suppressed um, in the public consciousness, but also like on a very private level. I think uh, it's really like um, an apparent thing in Black Medusa. Um, I don't know yeah, how there's it was, a lot yeah. of uh, yeah the night time and also the voiceover was directly influenced by the uh, film noir genre. There's a lot of films that starts and ends with the, the voiceover of the character, the um, the kind of uh, lighting that we used uh, was similar of the lighting that uh, they used uh, at that time. So there's a lot of yeah formal aspects. Uh, uh, that we try to um, to, yeah, to renew, to tell, uh, like tools, you know, we took those tools and we used them differently to tell another story, a story of our time and our, our country, you know. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay, great. I think that's uh, all the time that we had. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ismail. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. It was fast. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much.